in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. I would invite you to join with me in standing if you are able, as we sing our opening hymn, Joyful, Joyful. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Let us pray together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their sins. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
and grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Hearken now unto the comforting assurance of the grace of God promised in the gospel to all that repent and believe. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Unto as many of you, therefore, beloved friends, as truly repent of your sins, and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ with full purpose of new obedience, I announce and declare by the authority and in the name of Christ that your sins are forgiven according to his promise in the gospel through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Please be seated. I am so glad that you've chosen to join us on this holiday weekend, whether you're here in the sanctuary or in cyberspace. And for those of you that are in cyberspace, you need to know that the people of St. John's, it doesn't matter if it's a holiday, when it's the Lord's Day, they gather in strong numbers to worship. And so it's good to see so many of you. I'm thinking, though, that the weather helped build our attendance a little today. Just a thought. <laughs> I'm back with some energy after having a week at the Delaware Shore, and you can't do anything without being found out. Some friends that we stayed with posted a picture of us at the Dogfish Head Brewery and Distillery. You can't get away with anything nowadays. Now, for those of you that don't know me, I'm not much of a beer drinker. But it was the distillery part that could have gotten me into trouble. And uh, we had flights, you know, to test their wares. And uh, thank God we walked from where they live in Milton to the distillery. I'm not going to say we staggered home, but we got there safely. It's good to be here at St. John's. And, you know, sometimes people think summertime is a time when the people of church take off and gather, or I mean scatter and, and whatever. And that's true. And uh, we're welcoming people that have been away and are back. Uh, the Kaisers were at the beach. Um, where is Sarah, the Slavic? I saw her. She's, okay, she's been in Germany and she's back. You know, there's others that I don't know about. Uh, that have gone and come back and that is what summertime is but in the meantime our ministries continue and so uh, we are planning for vacation bible school and it's really exciting you can register online kids and maybe lee we can create an adult registration oh it's built in that so you adults register online 
There is information that is in your bulletin, a two-page spread of adult Bible school. There are posters around the building. I sent an email to Grace uh, Lutheran Church, who will be joining us for children and adult Bible school. So we're going to have a good time together in just a couple of short weeks. However, to ensure the safety of all, I would like to introduce to you uh, Gabe Hill, who is going to be chairing our security effort. And Gabe is going to just come up here, and I don't know if he wants to say anything. Gabe and his wife Sherry and their family are reasonably new to St. John's, but not really. It's been a year already, you know, because they were here last year for Bible school. So I want you to know who this guy is because put on the sternest <laughs> face that you can make. <laughs> well, you can't do that looking at me, I know. <laughs> No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, so yes, I'm, I'm going to help to coordinate the security efforts for the Vacation Bible School this year, and I'd like to have one or two friends join me. My wife will not join me. She's going to enjoy having me out of the house for a few days. And so uh, if I could have one or two people uh, commit to sign up every evening to help stroll the grounds with me and make sure everything is going smoothly, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. For the safety and security of all. And it doesn't have to be the same two people all five nights. It could be different people. But that's Gabe. You can see him and sign up with him. Linda Schaefer. Where are you, Linda? Did you want to say something? <laughs> OK. Oh, she's coming, though. She's coming. Well, Linda has for many years served this congregation as a treasurer on our consistory with teaching core, but she's been known as the queen of fundraising at St. John's. And we are working on a goal of replacing the old refrigerator down in the kitchen. And so we have an upcoming fundraiser to you, okay. Linda. Okay. Um, if you have any questions about why we're getting a refrigerator, the kitchen is a big part of our ministry. Amen. And, I mean, we <laughs> use it a lot. So um, we've had some incidents where the refrigerator part is freezing stuff. So we figure we kind of have to get a new one so that we can keep things going here. And uh, I also know how to guilt people. <laughs> so I'm pretty good at that. Ask Glenn. And, uh, we're That's her husband. <laughs> <laughs> we're having a chicken barbecue, if you don't know, on Saturday. And we have two, a goal of 320 chicken meals to, to sell to make this a really great fundraiser. So we need everybody's help to not only buy tickets for yourself, but maybe for your family or someone. I'm personally thinking of getting three more so I don't have to cook on Sunday. So, you know, ladies, you never know. But we do need your support and your help so that we can keep ministries going here at St. John's. Thank you. And I think right now about not a little over two thirds of the tickets are sold. A little over 200. So we need to sell another 120 tickets or so. So on your way out, grab five or 10, give them to your neighbors. I mean, pay for them, but you know. <laughs> or sell them to your neighbors, yes. <laughs> um, let's see, I'm gonna give this back to you. I think those are all of the announcements. There are other announcements in the bulletin. Um, the consistory is still in the process of the membership census. If you haven't, Given your forms, do that. We are going to be uh, completing that effort. There are other things that are ongoing. Uh, there is a special announcement about an upcoming change in when Consistory, which is our church governing board, will meet. Please read that. If you have insight into that, please speak to any number of the Consistory members, myself, or our church secretary, who is also our treasurer. So we will take your input and at the August meeting, they will make a final decision that will start in February of 2024 about this proposed change. Those are all of the announcements. Let us continue our worship together on this wonderful day.
I'd invite the children forward for the children's message. Welcome, everyone. You know what? That's exactly what I want to talk to you guys about today. That word, welcome. Does anyone know what it means? What does it mean when we say welcome? Hi. Hi. Yeah. Anyone else have any other ideas? Well, when we're being welcoming, do we just say hi? Or is it friendly? Is it warm? Is it kind when we're welcoming someone? Yeah, it's a warm and friendly way to receive someone. So sometimes people put the word welcome on their doormat or maybe a flag like this one. That's a pretty flower flag. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't have the, the flagpole right now. But sometimes people put them out front of their house to let visitors know that they're glad that they're, they're coming to their house, right? And sometimes people might wait at the airport for someone who's coming home from a long trip with a sign that says, welcome home. If you were coming back from a long trip, would that make you feel good if someone was waiting with a sign like that? Yeah? <laughs> well, do you know where else we see the word welcome a lot? Where do you think we might see the word welcome a lot? How about right here at church? Right? We see it on signs. We see it in our bulletins. And at our church, you'll hear people say a lot, no matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. And part of the reason the word welcome is so important in church is because Jesus taught us to be welcoming. In today's gospel lesson, Jesus says that welcoming one of his disciples is like welcoming him and his father. Being welcoming can be hard sometimes, though, right? Sometimes we're not that great at being friendly and warm to people that we don't know or people who might be different from us. But when Jesus told us to be welcoming, do you think he meant we should only welcome people who are just like us? No. We should welcome people who are different from us. We should welcome everyone, right? Should we welcome people who look different from us? Yeah. <laughs> should we welcome people who might speak a different language from us? Yeah. And what about people who maybe don't have much money or they don't have nice clothes to wear to church? Should we welcome them? Oh, we should give them more money? <laughs> well, Jesus does teach us to take care of people, right? He teaches us to help them, yeah. So Jesus wants us to welcome everyone. So can we think of some ways that we can welcome people who come to our church? Hugging them? Okay. What if you're... Oh, and kissing. Well, <laughs> maybe for family members, maybe you welcome them with a kiss, a kiss on the cheek, right? What about maybe someone you haven't met yet? What's some way you could welcome them? Handshake. That's a good one. Um, maybe you're a little bit shy, but do you think you could smile and wave at someone who's new to our church? Yeah. That would be a nice, friendly thing to do. What if someone didn't know where they were going? They didn't know where their Sunday school class was or where the bathrooms were. What could you do to welcome them? Do you think you could help them find their way around? Yeah. That would probably make them feel pretty welcome. And what if they didn't know anybody here at this church? Do you think you could invite them to sit with you during the service? Yeah, that would be really welcoming. 
So there's lots of different ways that we can be welcoming to people the way Jesus wants us to be, right? Can you bow your heads and pray with me? Dear God, thank you for welcoming us into your family. We know that you value and care for all people. Help us to be welcoming to others and show your love to those in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Good morning. The Hebrew scripture lesson today is Genesis 22, 1 to 18. This comes from the New Revised Standard Version. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there and we will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had showed him, Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord shall provide. And it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you, and I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of their enemies. And by your offspring shall all the nations of the earth gain blessings for themselves, because you have obeyed my voice. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel lesson from the New Revised Standard Version is Matthew 10, 37 to 42. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. 
And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous man in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly, I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the good news. Praise be to the Lord. I wish that somebody would have posted a picture of me last Sunday at Epworth United Methodist Church in Rehoboth Beach so that you knew that I was in church. But nobody did that. It was at the brewery. Oh, well. It was indeed a great experience last Sunday to feel warmth and welcome at that congregation. Uh, that is one of the congregations that has chosen to remain in the General Conference of the United Methodist Church, and warmly so. And they expressed great warmth and welcome last Sunday to me and to Mark. Many of you now subscribe to the United Church of Christ daily devotionals. They're called Still Speaking because we in some way believe that God is still speaking to us. And these devotions come right into your email. And if you need to know more about it, we can help you. Wendy, myself, others in the church, most of our consistory members receive those still speaking devotionals. Today's devotional by the Reverend Dr. Ken Samuel speaks about today's Hebrew scripture lesson which we will encounter in just a few moments. We will dig into that story. But before we do that, I was reminded of another still speaking devotional shared by Emily Heath. She's the senior minister and pastor at the Congregational Church in Exeter, New Hampshire. And this is what she wrote several years back. She said, perhaps this is wrong, but I have a hard time trusting church people who never admit imperfection. She goes on to say, I don't mean imperfection of the minor kind. I don't care that your kid's school lunches aren't perfectly balanced or that you skipped yoga class three times last week. I mean real imperfection, she says. You get addicted to something. I'm sorry, you got addicted to something. You got fired from your job, or you messed up big time, and it was all your fault. Truthfully, if we think about what Emily Heath has written, this sounds like the stuff that we want to avoid talking about at church. I don't want to tell you my biggest failures. We don't. Sometimes we don't want to hear about other people's big failures. And as far as I'm concerned, when we think about today's lectionary Hebrew scripture lesson, honestly, I'd just as soon avoid talking about it. It's one of those scripture stories that I really find troubling. The story from the book of Genesis is perhaps one of my least favorite scripture stories. And just to pique our interest in this scripture story, you've heard it read 
by Sandy. Now we're going to watch just a little bit of a video clip, a trailer to a movie that's about Abraham and Isaac. Let's watch this briefly together. What if God told me to do something I did not understand? Taking Isaac to Moriah will sacrifice to the Lord. Father, why do we sacrifice? We sacrifice out of obedience. That's how we worship. Do you find this story in the scripture abhorrent? Does it rock you to the core of your being? When I think about this scripture story, I'm troubled by it for several reasons. First of all, that God would require a human sacrifice of one son as a test of obedience. I struggle with that. And some would say, well, isn't that what Jesus was? I struggle with the fact that Abraham would seemingly go along with this whole test of God, yet really through maybe not a direct lie, but implication, not fully answer his son's question when they set off on this journey. God will provide a lamb. When he knows God is, in this story, is said to sacrifice his son. Do you think that could be religion gone crazy? Third thing that I struggle with in this story is that Abraham would go so far as to bind his son and raise a knife ready to sever his life-giving arteries. Do you find that story repulsive? in any way. Now, in this Bible story, should we assume that the psychological torture of one's son by seeking to literally follow God's command is normative behavior for people who seek to, God, to do God's will? And then can we draw the conclusion that to be someone willing to commit psychological terror to one's family, to lift a knife, to lift a hand, to lift a belt, to keep them in line, that such behavior is biblically normative, much less 
mandated by God. Or is this simply a dramatic story? Story. When I say story, I mean kind of like kind of like a legend. Is this just simply a legend? painted against a backdrop of a culture that embraced human sacrifice. And that the Hebrew people realized that they were other in their worship and religion of God. So was this a dramatic but not literal story told to end the religious practice of child sacrifice? and thereby transfer the guilt of sin or the act of devotion and worshiping God onto a blood sacrifice of an animal as opposed to human. Now, I've been around the sun dozens and dozens and dozens of times. And I know that when we move from speaking of Bible stories from a traditional or literal interpretation and leave that aside and begin venturing off into new territory, it makes a lot of people nervous. Nervous. You want to hold your hands up? I want to see who's shaking right now. Come on, come on. <laughs> Yet, for me, almost everything in my mind and heart recoils against this story. The video that I found to share this morning, when I first watched it, it made me weep. The one thing that was good in that video was you could see the anguish of Abraham. I picked that up. You know, he's praying in the dark there, crying out. But to talk to you about why I struggle about this, not just as a matter of biblical interpretation, but personally. It's founded in the events of my own personal life. My former spouse, Donna Dreyer, whom many of you have come to know through our medical clinics and pilgrimages to Kenya, we separated almost 30 years ago, it was 1994. At the time, each of us thinking that we needed to be obedient to God and faithful to who we were becoming. In the process, we strapped our children upon the altar of our journey through separation and divorce. I who recoil at the story of Abraham, seemingly, willingly, and perhaps torturously, dragged my children through the horrors of divorce so that I could become a whole person in mind, heart, and spirit before God. Nearly 30 years have passed since that all started to transpire. As we walked our separate journeys. And from the long view looking back, in retrospect, it was as if we lifted a knife to our children, ready to sever them from the life they knew. And I know that our children's personal spiritual journey has been caused no small amount of trauma by the choices Donna and I have made. I don't know, in our situation, if God provided a lamb. I just know it was painful for my three kids. 
I suppose if we're willing to honestly and to fully explore this biblical story of one man's attempt to be faithful to God, perhaps we can share our own stories of success and failure as we walk on our spiritual journeys toward what we think we hear God telling us. Going back to that still speaking devotion about Emily Heath that I started at the very beginning of this message, she goes on to say, people and things at church are just a little too neat and tidy she says, I get curious about that church's spiritual life. Why, she asks. Because no one's life is neat and tidy. And Christians should be the first ones to admit that. Christians are people who, re who have received God's grace. We should be people who at, the bed, at our bedrock that once were broken badly now know that God loved us and lifted us up. That's what Emily Heath has written. So for me, thinking about the story of Isaac's binding, as the Hebrew calls it, the Akedah. It has its own name, the Akedah, the binding. For me, this notion that Abraham was making a faith gesture out of his brokenness helps me to wrap my head around this story. After all, is it not our human brokenness that would allow us to instill psychological terror in the name of proper faith and religious practice? How many have heard, we will burn in hell if you don't ask Jesus into your heart? I did growing up. For me, this story reminds me that even when we have the best intentions to pass our faith onto our children, we can often do it in harmful and broken ways. Life, faith, yes, even all of the religious practices we call Christianity, well, it isn't just neat and tidy. It's messy, difficult, and at best, at times, even confusing. Returning to the end of Emily Heath's devotional, she writes, I was recently speaking at a conference, and I was asked what I saw as the best indication that a congregation will die. And this is what she replied. She said, a church that is full of people who cannot tell you about God's grace in their lives. And she continues in this devotion, why? Because people who know that they have received God's grace and who don't forget it, they know what church is all about. I pray that God's grace has been sufficient in my life for the harm that I've perpetrated against my own children. I believe that I'm going to go forward in God's grace. Dear friends, church is not about keeping up appearances, wearing the right color of the season. When it's red on Pentecost, we all wear red or whatever. Or putting on your best clothes. Church is not about appearing morally righteous because none of us are good enough apart from God's grace. And church is certainly not about saying the right things in order to get ahead in life. The focus of Christianity is this. Knowing, apart from Jesus Christ, 
we were lost. But now, through his warm welcome, we have been found. Emily concludes, until we are a church full of people that can tell stories of our rock-bottom circumstances without shame, we will never be a church that can truly share God's grace. So this morning, as we conclude our time of pondering God's word together, I ask you, so what abhorrent sacrifice have you attempted to make in God's name? Let us pause in silence, and then I will lead us in our pastoral prayer. Realizing that we are responsible to God and for one another, let us offer our concerns and prayers together. Let us pray. God of ancient stories. God imagined by ancient writers. God whom we have a hard time wrapping our minds and spirits around. Draw close to us. Help us to have the right amount of respect for the biblical text and a willingness to explore the edges and to put ourselves in the biblical story. God, when we think about the world that we live in, we know we need your wisdom. In a world shaped by conflict, where we quickly draw battle lines or revert to our own tribal divisions, you call us to welcome those with whom we have absolutely nothing in common. And then, O oh God, in a country where discrimination seems to be encouraged by our highest court, we pray, O oh God, in the midst of inequities, which only seem to be widening, that you would call us to treat each person we encounter as sister and brother. Yes, O oh God, in a time of intensifying injustices, which are found in each of our communities, if not even in our neighborhoods, you call us to yoke ourselves to your radical hope. And then in a nation and in a world that idolizes the success of the individual to the exclusion of all others, you call us to notice the parent who works two or three jobs to make ends meet. You call us to see the dementia-diminished senior citizen struggling with activities of daily living. And you call us to see the refugee family huddling in a corner, frightened and alone. In all of these circumstances, dear God, may we offer not just a cup of cold water, but enable us, O oh God, to share all that we are and all that we have to those who are in our midst, even as we pray the prayer to you, God in community, holy and one, that you taught us through Jesus, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Stewardship is not about sacrifice. It's about honor. Honoring God with who we are and what we have. May we do that in a way that will please God. Thank you for that offertory. I don't know about you, but when I reflect on my life, 
I can feel humbled by the times when I've sacrificed my kids, perhaps you, in the name of doing religion right. But thankfully, through all of that, yes, Jesus loves me. And yes, Jesus loves you. It touched my heart, Lee. Almighty God, fountain of all goodness and truth, receive our thanks for the revelation of thy grace, which is able to make us wise unto salvation. And mercifully grant, we beseech thee, that the words with we have heard this day may through thy blessing be so gifted, grafted in our hearts, that they may bring forth in us the fruit of good living, to the honor and praise of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It's a tradition here at St. John's, although if you're not comfortable with that particular tradition, I would say you could have a response, but our church family holds hands in the singing of this hymn. If you're not comfortable with that, just lift your hands like this. That'll say, I'm not comfortable. <laughs> I'm going to lift my hands like that to empower you to do the same if that's your choice. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.